Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Murray, the Coordinator of Sustainable Practices for Metropolitan Community College. Thank you so much for joining us for the second installment of the SLPS uh, series for the 2015-2016 academic year. Uh, this is a partnership between Central Community College, Jocelyn Institute for Sustainable Communities, Metropolitan Community College, University of Nebraska-Lincoln Environmental Studies, and Wayscott, Nebraska. Today we are very lucky to have William Blackburn, a global sustainability expert with hands-on experience building sustainability programs at major companies. He will discuss the recent consensus on the scope of practical meaning of sustainability that has emerged from large global multi-stakeholder forums and from corporate usage. He will also share his proven approach for infusing sustainability into the lifeblood of company operations, a process he calls a sustainability operating system. Um, please, this is interactive, so during the presentation, join the conversation by using Twitter and the hashtag SLPS Thursday, that's hashtag SLPS Thursday, or using the chat box on the right of your screen. Um, you can also give your questions to your room host. William, William will be answering your questions during the live Q&A at the end of his presentation. So at this point, I'd like to go ahead and introduce William Blackburn for everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, indeed, we're going to talk about business and sustainability today, and it's going to be from my perspective, from perspective of a guy who uh, led the development of environment, health, and safety and sustainability programs for several decades at a uh, $10 billion um, global medical products company in Chicago. So uh, this is all business and nothing but business. Uh, but uh, some of you, while not familiar with my corporate experience, may have seen, if I can get this to move, there we go, may have seen the article in the World Herald a, a few weeks ago about my nature center uh, down in uh, Fremont County, just about an hour from here. Uh, we've tried to restore the place to uh, native prairie and taking out invasive species and all that. And in fact, next week, I'll be meeting with some of the directors of other nature centers up and down the Las Hills uh, to try to reach some consensus about a Las Hills week, where we can do a blitz informing people on the nature and quality of the hills and inviting them out and letting them see it and become more educated about its value and, and really enjoy the place. So hopefully, uh, that will move forward. And any of you out there that are interested in joining the Lus Hills effort for Lus Hills Week, uh, please get in touch with me. But today, we're going to talk about uh, business and sustainability from this perspective. Now, most of you think, well, okay, I know about sustainability. It's all about recycling and energy conservation and climate change and that sort of thing. Uh, but actually, what's happening is uh, there's more of a consensus being formed if you're paying attention globally uh, through um, big multi-stakeholder networks, multi-year networks, uh, where unions and companies and governments and activists are all coming together to say, this is what we expect from companies and other organizations that raise their hand and say, I want to move towards sustainability. So we're going to see what those consensus expectations are, and it's uh, maybe broader than you think. But after that, we'll move on to talk about how to implement uh, this concept of sustainability into the lifeblood of an organization, in particular a business. And I'll draw on my decades of practical experience and talk about the key elements of, of doing that very thing. And actually, this is also an approach that has been used consistently across the board by a number of other large organizations, and small ones too. First question, I mean, before we set out to do sustainability organization is what is it we're doing? What is this term really all about? And of course, when you try to define anything, you kind of think about, well, how did Noah Webster define, you know, the words he put in the dictionary? Well, you go out and see how the word is being used. And so that's really what we need to do at this stage is go back and see how is sustainability being used? What does it mean in that context? And in fact, what we have to do is go beyond the old traditional definitions that came out of the United Nations Frontline Commission some 30 years ago. Sustainable development, which is sort of the thing that led into sustainability. 
defined as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It was basically this notion that we need to live off the interest of our economic, social, environmental capital and leave the principle for future generations so that they can have as good a life, if not better, than we have today. But as you'll see, you know, that was nice and warm and fuzzy, but it really provided little help to organizations or people within those organizations who were trying to make sustainability happen there. So there was a need to further define what those expectations were, what it was that we really had to do if we want to move our organization towards sustainability. And so in turn, what we have to do is look at what the implied expectations are uh, from organizations like the Global Reporting Initiative and uh, certain CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Reports. We have some four to 5,000 major companies that are providing those public reports every year. And if you look to see what they're reporting on and why they're reporting, there are certain expectations they're trying to address. And we'll talk about what those are. But today, we can actually go beyond implied expectations and we can look to express expectations, uh, uh, express expectations that are coming out of voluntary standards. Again, Global Reporting Initiative, it has sustainability reporting guidelines used by thousands of companies. Uh, the International Standards Organization, Standard on Social Responsibility, United Nations Global Compact, you have ethos in uh, Latin America, STARS, which is a big sustainability standard for universities, STAR Community Index for, for communities. And beyond that, there are now ma mandatory integrated reporting uh, standards that are emerging. Think of the Securities and Exchange Commission. They're the folks that regulate the finances and investment. They also tell companies what they're expected to report every quarter on their finances. Well, the SEC counterparts in other countries, namely, you know, UK, South Africa, France, Sweden, and others, now are saying, look, we want more than just financial information. We want so social information. We want information about your environmental performance as well. And so these so-called integrated reporting standards are beginning to spread. And in fact, the SEC itself is beginning to look at these as well. They've got standards on climate change and showing what climate change impacts are. They're saying companies, look, you need to start talking about that in your financial reports. You need to talk about board diversity. And you need to talk about um, what they call conflict minerals. That is, you need to search through your supply chains, look, look among your suppliers and see where your minerals are coming from. And if they're coming from certain companies, certain countries in Africa, where the minerals are being provided by terrorist groups or rebel groups that don't respect human rights, then we want to be able to know about that. We want you to tell the public about it and, of course, try to address that. So even the SEC is getting into the integrated reporting, uh, mandatory integrated reporting. And there's a study done by the conference board. Actually, I worked with the conference board some years ago with a number of companies. This is a, an organization of major uh, companies in the U.S. and uh, pulled together a group with regard to sustainability to see what their consensus was about the meaning and direction of sustainability. And we'll talk a little bit about the findings there. So I said there's a global consensus coming about, and here's this little uh, table gives you an idea of, of that consensus and how it's, it's coming, coming down. Uh, on the right column, we have the uh, indicator categories from the Global Reporting Initiative Sustainability Reporting Standards. And these are the various categories, and under them are specific indicators that GRI wants you to report. And again, this is the standard that's the, sort of the gold standard reporting used by thousands of companies around the globe. In the left column is the core subjects from the International Standards Organization Social Responsibility 26,000 standard. And uh, again, uh, you'll see a number of different categories that they focus on where they lay out what the expectations are for companies acting and reporting uh, on those topics. And if you line them up, you see pretty good consensus. We'll talk about governments, systems and processes for assuring ethical and legal compliance. We'll talk about human rights, discrimination, that sort of thing. Labor practices, safety and health, fair wages. We'll talk about environmental issues. We'll talk about fair operating practices, dealing with corruption, uh, antitrust, and that, that sort of thing. Consumer and product issues are also part of the package. And community involvement and development, uh, great expectations for companies to do uh, action on those, on those fronts. 
And then, at least with regard to sustainability, there's a final and all important one, which is the economic viability of the organization itself. Because without the organization, you lose employment. There's a whole host of environmental and uh, social implications of having your company go out of business. So certainly the GRI folks recognize that, and they ask that you report on the economic viability of your organization as you're providing your sustainability report. So if you put these together, basically these eight topics are what emerge. These are the topics that cover sustainability, including economic viability of the organization. It's not that sustainability is a separate silo. It's part of the lifeblood of the organization. Economic viability is part of that as well. Just to show you how that's playing out in the field, here is a, a list of uh, different companies who have developed supplier codes of conduct. These are codes that they send out to their suppliers and they say, look, this is what we expect you to do. This is how we expect you to behave. And I've got the sampling from McDonald's, Nestle, Nike, Nova Nordisk, and Walmart. And you can see the topics that are covered. And interesting as it is, these tend to match up with that list we just talked about. You've got human rights, non-discrimination, health and safety, labor practices, environmental things, and, and illegal compliance and a host of others. But this is uh, really proof that that consensus that I talked about is being felt and acted upon, um, certainly among major companies. And this is uh, how it's playing out in the United Nations. Uh, some years ago, the United Nations adopted what they call the Millennium Development Goals, which were goals for countries to meet around sustainability. Those goals have just expired this year, and they're re-upping re for a new set of goals that will carry them to 2030. And you can see the topics here again economic topics like poverty and full employment, number eight, uh, social topics, hunger, education, gender equality, health, and the like, and of course, environmental issues as well. So again, here's another place where you see economic, social, environmental issues uh, laid out uh, for focus by individual countries. And actually, amazing as this may seem, the United Nations and the uh, Millennium Development Goals really had a pretty significant effect, and there was pretty good progress on major fronts. But, you know, certainly not the end of the day for that. And the uh, UN recognizes there's much more to be done, and ergo, uh, we've got a new set of goals, some 15 goals coming out um, of the UN uh, more recently. The other thing that's happening as we see how the word sustainability is being used um, is that the real uh, name of the game these days of sustainability is the word integration. How do you build sustainability into the lifeblood of the organization? Not a separate program, a separate silo that sits over here in the corner that you give a nod to and a wink once in a while, but really the way we do business, the way the business is done. How do you infuse sustainability into that? And so you see from these different surveys, uh, they're saying today companies are now increasingly integrating sustainability in how they manage every aspect of their business. And you're seeing another survey here, uh, this one from 800 experts in uh, about 90 countries. It says, long-term commitment to sustainability values integrated deeply into the organization uh, is considered, you know, that's one of the factors they look to to consider whether uh, you're a sustainability leader, or at least these 800 expert, experts thought so. So integration is becoming more and more the key aspect of sustainability that has to be there because this sustainability without integration takes you nowhere. And so basically, if you look at all of these things we just talked about, you kind of boil it down and sift through it, um, you kind of come up with this sort of practical definition of sustainability. And you really look at it as value-driven management, values-driven management. So if you're saying, well, we have to integrate economic, social, environmental considerations into our decision-making from the CEO all the way to the person on the line in the factory, how do you do that? Well, if you set up, you can create a set of values and you say to everyone, look, we're expecting that you're going to use these values as a filter for all the decision making you make in this, in this company. Uh, that's one way to making sure that sustainability is part of the lifeblood. And so what are those values? Well, you can say it's around economic, social, environmental responsibility, planet, profit, and uh, so forth. But I like to boil it down to something even simpler, which is the two are respect for people and other living things, for one, and the wise use of economic and natural resources. So really that's what it's all about. And what, what joins those two things together? Well, 
the whole purpose of this. And the purpose is for sustaining and promoting the long-term well-being of the organization and society, including the environment. So this whole notion of sustainability, it's about sustaining well-being, promoting well-being. And how do you do that? You do that by focusing on respect and resources. How do you integrate that into the organization? You make those the core values that you're going to evaluate everybody in the organization against as they make their decision making. You're going to hold them accountable. You're going to say, this is what we really believe in. And you're going to act that way as well. So a uh, very practical definition to our values-based management approach. Now, you say, OK, Bill, that's all well and good. But now we've got this issue of sustainable products. You call it maybe green products and so forth. How does this to our thing relate to that? Well, it's the very same thing. Sustainable products, what are they about? Improving the efficient use of natural and economic resources along the product life cycle. So it's not just you know, how the product impacts the environment and social issues you know, as it's in the hands of the consumer, but where did you get the raw materials for this? Were there lots of adverse environmental and social conditions that, that were there at the time these uh, resources were collected, the metals were mined, the products were produced? And so you really need to look from cradle, from the, from the birth of the raw materials all the way to the grave, that is the ultimate disposition, disposal, what have you, of the product. But it's not just resources. Of course, we have respect as well. So this product uh, needs to accommodate the needs of people and other living things along the product life cycle. So it's not just, OK, uh, we have to have a product that's safe for our consumers. Certainly, certainly that's part of the respect. But, but also, we have to respect the people that are producing the raw materials, producing the product. We can't have sweatshops out there and say that we're really doing that, right? So more and more, people, as they look at sustainable products, and sometimes called green products, they're saying, we really need both. I actually, uh, in many of the conferences I do, I ask people, OK, if you've got a, a green product, which traditionally meant you know, environmentally attractive product, uh, if you have one that's really attractive environmentally, but it's produced in the sweatshop, would you consider that a green product? And more and more people are saying no. Green, to me, means something good and wholesome. And it also encompasses, they think, uh, at least this is what I'm hearing, more of this second issue as well, the respect for people. So two R's are critical, both in the definition and in the way you're looking at products. Here's another a piece of uh, sort of consensus that uh, emerged. Uh, again, this was from the conference board study I did. And these are the companies I were, was working with. Many of them you'll recognize. Coke, my old company, Baxter, Campbell Soup, uh, Xerox, and so forth and so on. And so I asked them, I said, OK, what, you know, you're all promoting sustainability, working towards sustainability. What do you think this really uh, suggests? What are the expectations you're feeling from stakeholders about what you're expected to do on sustainability. What does it mean? Is it just recycling, you know, climate change, energy conservation, or is it something more? And they said, oh, no, 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 it's something more. And out of that discussion came this sort of consensus model policy that says, all right, if we're moving towards sustainability, what we really have to do is work on economic success. We have to push for that, both making sure that our own organization is economically successful so that we are sustaining our employment and, and the good things that we can do but also contributing to the economic success of the community, making sure that you know, the taxes we pay, the sourcing for, for materials and products, um, the, the philanthropy that we're giving all help boost and, and promote the, the, the prosperity of the community where we do business. So economics, both from a company perspective and a community perspective. When it comes to the social side, certainly uh, expectations are you've got to respect them your employees, both with regard to wages and, and benefits, uh, looking at uh, you know dealing with management, having constructive land management labor relations, and open um, you know opportunities for collective bargaining. Uh, you've got to make sure that you know it's a, a health and a healthy and safe workplace, no doubt about that. And that uh, you know you even you know go into issues like termination practices to make sure that. Those are done in a very respectful way. And, I, and, and the all-encompassing, all-challenging issue that comes out of this is the old work-life balance, which everybody is struggling with. But again, focus on that is part of this expectation around sustainability performance. 
Diversity is the second issue, and that's not just the diversity among employees, but also among your board members and among the suppliers that you select for uh, your products, your uh, materials, and uh, and goods for uh, for producing your products. Responsible governance, making sure you got processes in place uh, to assure the ethical and legal compliance of the organization. Respect for stakeholders, and that means not only being open and transparent, telling the truth. Uh, making sure that people understand what the situation really is and not hiding issues from them, but also engaging them in dialogue and then collaborating them, co collaborating with them around certain key issues. Uh, that's really what this respect for stakeholders is about. And then fair dealing with customers, uh, not only meeting the expectations that customers have of you, but also anticipating their needs and trying to fulfill them as well. On the environmental side, all those things you would suggest, you would think, uh, you know, resource conservation, energy conservation, preventing waste and properly managing it, making sure you risk are controlled, and if you mess up and you contaminate someplace, you've got to, you know, live up to the responsibility of going out there and, and repairing it, restoring the property to its original condition. Uh, supply chain impacts, making sure that you're working with your suppliers and your communities to lower your environmental footprints. So basically, these are what the, that group of companies, those major companies, said, yeah, this is what we think our stakeholders expect of us. And so when you're struggling to see uh, what it is that we're supposed to do around sustainability, you really need to get down to something like this. Now, you, each company will have their own version of this and their own set of values to reflect in it, but this is the gist of what sustainability is about from a nuts and bolts perspective, at least according to those companies. And this is, of course, consistent with some of the other consensus we saw uh, coming out of GRI and ISO and the like. So certainly sustainability is more than recycling, energy conservation, and climate change. In fact, let's look at some of the topics. You know, that's a lot of stuff in there. You say, well, Bill, you know, there's like a thousand topics in it tucked away in those paragraphs. Well, yeah, there's a lot of them. And so uh, in economic topics, oh, yeah, you've got income and liabilities, those internal economic issues, but you also have like community donations and taxes, some external economic issues as well. Social issues, diversity, um, child labor, employee turnover, uh, but you also, again, internal, but you also have support for community services, which is an external focus of uh, the social aspect of sustainability. And the environmental side, all the things you expect, air pollution, climate change, uh, recycling, water conservation, uh, just about everything that you read about in the paper on the environment is it's somewhere on this list. So, you know, what's the real takeaway from this? You see, you look at the policy, you say, oh, well, there's all these issues there that potentially could have an impact and that you may need to think about. What are the issues? What are some observations? Well, I like to think of the old movie, City Slickers. Everybody see City Slickers in the old days. Remember Jack Pence, the old crusty Jack Pence? He said, the secret to life is, what was the secret to life? The secret to life is, the secret to life is one thing, right? Unfortunately, he never told us what that one thing was, but it was one thing. The secret to life is one thing. Well, unlike Jack Palance and, and City Slickers, sustainability is not about one thing. We just saw that, right? It's about a whole host of things, host of things. So then the real question is, all right, if sustainability is about a whole host of things, and I'm expected to go into my management and try to sell them on it. What's the business case for sustainability? How do I make a business case when there's all these issues? Well, when you get down to it, making a business case for sustainability is sort of the wrong, well, it's really the wrong question. Really what you ask is the business case for sustainability is this. It's, it's really the business case for some process that looks at sustainability trends and issues and then prioritizes among the opportunities and threats to an organization to select those for action that contribute the most value, the most value to the organization itself and the most value to society. So the business case, well, the business case is for this process. When I engage in this process, that process is going to produce value. It's going to help us find value. So that's really the case you need to make with your management. Come on, let's venture down this path with this process and let's see what we can prospect for, what, my, what, what mines that we need to pursue to find the gold value of gold in those, those efforts. So somewhere in among these issues, we focus on the right ones in the right way, we'll get real value. And when we talk about opportunities and threats, which is where the value lies, 
It's the traditional thing. Well, we may find that, okay, we can improve our productivity. If we reduce waste, we become more efficient. We may find that our reputation is enhanced, our brand is strengthened. We may find that the communities appreciate and support us more because of the things we're doing. We may find that we've got new markets. We may find new products out of this, this approach. So those are some of the opportunities. And quite frankly, when you see the reports, most companies tend to spend more time talking about the opportunities. But you can bet your, your, your bottom dollar that in the back of their mind, they're also focused on the threats. They don't want legal problems. They don't want financial problems, reputational problems, competitive problems, or operational problems. And this is, these, these problems lurking in the back of their mind is another big motivation for companies to move forward uh, on sustainability and this process that I talked about. So let's take an example. Here's a, here's a sustainability trend uh, captured in this little picture. This is the, uh, uh, it shows you, you know, what the, some experts were projecting in another 10 years with regard to water scarcity. And if you look at the green uh, tab at the bottom there where we have adequate levels of water, basically adequate level is, uh, if you do the whole map here, it's 1,700 cubic meters of water per person per year. You go down to up to, up to uh, 1,000, it's stress level, down to uh, 500 scarcity and, and below 500 extreme scarcity. And the real troubling thing about this is there's a lot of red on that map. Uh, and we shouldn't be surprised to think of what's been going on in California this year. They're, they're getting it full force. And a lot of those states out in the western U.S. are facing the same sort of issues. And if not in the news now, we'll still, soon be in the news over the years to come. So, okay, you're a company like my old company, uh, Baxter, that made IV solutions with lots of water, or you're a company like Coca-Cola that depends on water uh, for, for its products. This water issue is a big deal. It should be something that we look at strategically, right? It's a sustainability issue. There are big threats and opportunities here. So how do you really go about analyzing the situation? And so here I've shown the next sort of a, a, a theoretical or approach that, that one of those companies might take looking at water, sustainability issue, looking at threats, and in fact this SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunity, threats, is really what companies do as they, they go about looking at strategic initiatives, trying to prioritize for, uh, you know, action. And in this case I've presented it out, uh, it's not exactly a SWOT, I've got more of a top SWOT uh, threat, opportunity, strength, weakness, but let's just look at these. So, for example, a company like Coke or Baxter might say, oh, well, we've got threats, certainly water shortages can jeopardize our operations. Certainly that's true about Baxter, and certainly it's true about Coke. And we might say, oh, some of our competitors have long-term water rights. Oh, wait a minute. You know, if we might have our supplies cut off and have to reduce production because of water shortage, and yet our competitors are, you know, chugging along, continuing to produce their product, big problem, right? Opportunity is that, okay, we've got some water conservation projects and they can save money and they can help secure our supply and uh, more on-site water treatment and reuse may be possible. That will help too. And we ourselves may be able to secure some long-term water rights. Strength is that we've got some conservation projects underway. We've got a top-notch engineering firm, uh, engineering uh, department that can help move more of these projects along. Weakness is that we don't have certain long-term rights in some of our critical regions. And some communities uh, serving our factories may have poor water quality supply infrastructure. So this is how you kind of tee the issue up. You say, okay, here are our strengths and weaknesses, here's opportunities and threats. And out of that, you then brainstorm about actions to be taken to try to reduce and manage your threats and try to take advantage of those opportunities. So that's just one issue, uh, one trend, uh, and one uh, example of how a company uh, like Coke and Baxter can't put address it, and how that uh, SWOT analysis may play out in, in such a case. Now, uh, water, not just the only issue, certainly it's a big and looming issue, but there are a lot of other trends. And in my book, uh, this is uh, the old sustainability handbook, uh, offered now at half price, <laughs> along with two Ginsu knives and a uh, slicer and dicer, but uh, actually not true about the last part, but uh, my book's coming out in second edition in another couple of months, so this one is offered a significant discount for anybody who is here to pick one up today. Uh, those of you uh, off in the distance uh, may have a little trouble getting here within the next hour, but 
maybe we can work something out. Uh, so here in the book, we have a su I have a summary and appendix of all of these sustainability trends, what the latest data is, what the issues are, and so forth. And so here's a, a, just a sampling of growth of global business competition. So since World War II, there's been a tenfold increase in multinational corporations. Uh, 37 of the top 100 economies in the world are co now corporations. And so that's one of the conditions. One of the responses is obviously at the top opposition to, to, to globalization. You've got more and more folks saying, wait a minute, you know, enough with this globalization. You're outsourcing all of these jobs to countries with low environmental and social and labor standards. So in another response going to the bottom of the green list, growing power of these so-called NGOs, non-governmental organizations or civil society organizations, basically big multinational activist groups, 150% increase in the number of global activist groups in the last couple of decades. And of course, over on the conditions, other things, uh, population growth going from seven to nine billion. But at the same time, you're seeing you know, immigration, lower fertility, and in fact, in Europe, uh, with their fertility rate, number of children per family dropping below 2.1, which is the level which you have to make, you, you have to achieve to sustain, maintain your, your population levels. You know, those countries, a lot of those countries are seeing uh, declines in population. And in terms of economy and e economic growth, that's posing real problems for them. So, you know, actually, interestingly, uh, one of the answers may be for them to step up immigration, which is certainly they're facing right now. So, you know, while they're facing this crisis and they're, they're arguing about it and complaining about it, actually it may be one of the best things that could happen to those countries from an economic perspective to have an infusion of more people to help, you know, boost the growth while their, their native population is actually reducing in, in population. So you've got that. You've got um, climate change, of course, threats to biodiversity, you know, one-fourth of the uh, – uh, mammals and one third of the amphibians now threatened with extinction, according to uh, the experts. Uh, fish depletion, a uh, whole host of things, and and the spread of hazardous pollutants. Big issue still not resolved. And we've got lots of laws on this, but still goes on. And so, in the responses, you see, oh, we got extended producer responsibility. That's a big issue in Europe, becoming more here, and that is an expectation for companies to reduce the risk of their products. Uh, to get in there and uh, you know take action on it, and where the risks still remain, to make sure you're informing your your consumers about them, uh, and making sure if you do cause harm that you compensate people for that harm, and at the end of the day you take responsibility for the products and the packaging at the end of its use. So in Europe, there's these laws on taking back packaging, for example, and uh, more and more they're saying, look. It's not the consumer's problem. It's not the government's problem. It's you, the company's problem. You've got to figure out what to do with this stuff after, after its use is completed. Rise of socially responsible investing, another trend. Uh, right now in the U.S., you've got one of every $9 of professionally managed investment is now uh, done with some sort of social or environmental uh, issues factored in, considerations factored in. A uh, whole host of these issues. Uh, responses, conditions, and if you really want to understand sustainability, you can't do that unless you understand these issues. So I've uh, got to do your homework. You can't say you really know about sustainability without knowing about what's happening in the world. And this is really the world uh, that's emerging around which business must plan. You know, when you're sitting in a meeting, you're planning the fate of your organization, the director of your organization, you want some, and you, you have in your head some understanding of what the world is likely to be like or what the trends are in the world, and you really can't do effective business planning unless you understand these things and how they may be affecting your business and your business plans. So you're taking a look at the, the definition of sustainability and, and the like. Uh, now let's take a little glance, a short little glance here at the, the so-called sustainable product or green products. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I just, you know, it's the fad, it's the fad. I got to get into green, making green products. You know, I can make a fortune with green products and so forth and so on. Well, uh, maybe, but again, remember, we've got to deal with resources. It's got to deal with respect. And the reality is that's not easy to do. And also the reality is not every green product is going to be successful. 
Just ask you know, Thomas Edison and his electric car. Great idea. Perfect. Uh, just about 100 years too early and didn't have support from Henry Ford or John D. Rockefeller and all those guys. So his plans were somewhat upset. The timing wasn't right. Idea was good. So timing is everything. Or think about these uh, little fluorescent bulbs. Remember, move toward compact fluorescent? Well, that was a sort of an interim stage. That I don't know how many of those I had in my closet that didn't work, and I was trying to figure out how to put them together, and it was a nightmare. But eventually, you know, business worked through it and came out with things that are more acceptable. This last one is a very interesting one. It's a Whirlpool refrigerator. And Whirlpool won $35 million making this refrigerator. They were in a contest that was sponsored by some power companies, and they said, okay, these power companies said, we will put up $35 million, which we will award to the company that can come up with a refrigerator that doesn't use chlorofluorocarbon, Freon, as a, as, a, as a refrigerant gas, and that is super efficient electronically. And so Whirlpool did that. Here's the refrigerator that won the $35 million. And so they put it on the market, and they had it subsidized for a while, and then they took the subsidies away, and it didn't sell. And you go, well, wait a minute. How can this It's much more efficient, it's much, you know, how could this not sell? Well, the reality was, you know, it had all these great attributes, but they didn't have the regular, you know, customer-facing uh, marketing folks involved in the design. And so they ended up with a refrigerator that was the wrong size for the, for the customer segment that this was, was likely to buy this kind of refrigerator. So it's like, eh, okay, we did a lot of things right, but we did a lot of things wrong. And so Whirlpool actually learned, and now they've got their stackable duet washer dryers that have all these environmental features, but are also more delicate for clothes and, you know, very attractive and energy efficient and so forth and so on. So that was an example that the duets uh, washer dryers where they really did a good job of integrating social environmental considerations into design considerations that, uh, you know, were of, of biggest concern to their consumers. So live and learn. But again, not every green product is successful. And the reality is uh, you can't always charge more for a green product. But there are some circumstances where you can. And so let's take a look at some of those. One, yeah, people will pay more if you've got a product that's uh, going to be healthier for them or it's going to be safer for them. You know, health and safety, big things. People are willing to pay for that. Uh, you look at all these health food stores that, you know, Whole Foods, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that they're environmentally sensitive so much as that they think, oh, no pesticides, okay, I've uh, got to be much safer for my children, et cetera. And, you know, just go out to buy a house and see what it costs to get a house that's on a lakefront someplace. You've got a natural uh, living environment, you're going to pay a premium. And some people are going to go out and then pay more for, like, a hybrid car and where perhaps their gas bills will go down. Some will do the math and say, okay, if I invest now, I can save money in the long term, and, uh, and are willing to do that. Not everybody, but some. This is an interesting thing. This is a, there's a, there's a big pitch by companies like Unilever and Procter & Gamble to, they're looking for growth, they're looking for growth, they've capped all the you know, industrialized markets, and they're saying, wait, one place we haven't gone is we haven't gone to you know, the developing world. We haven't gone into these tribal areas and so forth. These people need products as well, so how can we design products that are suitable for them? And they have found some ways. And one way is to come up with these sachets, these little packets, single-dose packets of shampoo or laundry detergent, which they sell for a few pennies. People will be able, and those, those communities will be able to buy that and use it, and they do. And, and those companies, Unilever, P&G, have made a big market out of selling products in the developing world, at the so-called bottom of the economic pyramid. But they've got to break barriers in cost and pricing. Uh, there's some, like I know there's groups in India that have brought down the cost of cataract surgery to $25, brought down the cost of hearing aids to $50 using established patents and, and technologies, not you know the top of the line market, but something that's very suitable and produces good health outcomes. So, the secret there is breaking barriers on cost and pricing if you want to sell to those markets and, and, and attract customers at the bottom of the economic pyramid. Uh, cost sharing as well. Sometimes you can see uh, businesses that, in those places where they will lease out a cell phone for an hour or two in a, a day uh, to individuals to make calls on agriculture products and the like. So 
cost sharing, price share, or use sharing, low cost operations, uh, cost and pricing um, are very important in those strategies. Governments can create markets. That's the other rule here. Uh, the classic example is uh, those uh, Energy Star computers. Uh, you know, the Clinton administration said, we're not buying a single computer unless it's got the Energy Star stamp on it, which shows that it's uh, an energy efficient product. And, you know, because of that, Companies started producing more and more Energy Star computers, and now they're everywhere. In fact, it's unusual to find one that's not Energy Star. So governments can create markets, uh, and um, frankly, they should do more of that. Some uh, small percentage of customers will pay more just for ethical reasons. This is the true blue greens who feel very strongly about the environment, about social issues, and they'll go out of their way even to pay a little more. Um, if they think that they're doing good in the, in, the, uh, in society. And of course, here's a, here's a classic example, some customers will avoid products uh, and companies where they feel that there's a, a, pub, a highly publicized social environmental stigma. I know people that have you know, not bought any uh, BP gas for some time because of the things that happened in the Gulf. That happens. People do respond. They feel personally about that and they don't want to contribute to that and evil that they see out there or, or that uh, the social ills that maybe fall uh, may be fallen some people because of the actions of their of, of the company that's trying to sell these products so they'll people are react people boycott they are you know it's, it's real uh, it's not just a hypothetical thing um, people do boycott products when there's a, a problem some commercial customers will pay more uh, if they can gain a clear reputational advantage for their own customers Customers, you go look at uh, recycled paper. Uh, I try to buy some. Hey, you know, quite a bit more expensive. Why do companies buy recycled paper if it's more expensive? Well, because they can say, look, we buy recycled pipe paper. We're doing our part to help, uh, you know, encourage recycling of materials. Uh, it's an environmentally attractive thing to do. And even though it costs a little more, it's not going to kill us to pay for that. And we're going to do it because it's the right message to send. And so. You see uh, some of that happening. Certainly uh, commercial customers will pay more uh, if they feel they can get that kind of an advantage. Now, the bottom line is, okay, these are some exceptions where you can probably charge more for a green product, but if it's not one of those situations, um, probably can't charge more. But the reality is uh, you can get out there and promote the environmental social attributes of your product, and a lot of companies are trying to figure out how to do that with the labeling. Uh, uh, and, but you can promote it, and in fact, you may find that you're able to differentiate your product from your competitors and maybe increase sales, even though uh, you couldn't possibly probably do that if you try to raise the price. So these things can be environmental advantages, social advantages, even the cause-based marketing where you try to align yourself with some good social environmental cause. These can be differentiating factors, not primary factors that uh, consumers will look to as they make their choices on their products and decide what prices to pay. But, you know, when you, when you go about uh, sort of creating a green product strategy for your organization, it's not like, oh, there's, you know, we're just going to do this and everybody will like it. You really need to understand that there are market segments. There are, as I say, these true blue-greens, and they're maybe up to a fifth of the, of the population. The folks that go out there will actually pay more and will really want to show through their purchasing practices that they support social environmental causes. There's another sort of layer down, um, I call it sympathetic, pragmatic, well and greens, well, health and wellness greens. These are the folks that are going to buy the Priuses because they think they can save money on gas. These are the people that are going to go out and buy products because they're healthier for them, they don't have pesticides and so forth. These people will easily be convinced to buy, but they need a reason. Down below that are those folks that are just kind of confused. There may be a, up to a quarter of the population that really doesn't have a clue and they're like kind of wandering around in the forest. They don't know, and they kind of put things off because they don't understand it. And then at the bottom, maybe up to a third, uh, folks that couldn't care less, the real browns, if you will. Uh, they don't bother me with that stuff. It's nonsense. I've got other things to do. So these are market segments. And, of course, the message if you're trying to appeal to the top two levels different than the messages that you may use if you think that you can sell to the bottom two. And it may well be that the bottom level, if you've got you push, pursuing a green strategy, may not be worth uh, focusing it on, uh, on at all. So 
these are things that you really need to put into the planning process, try to understand what segment you're going for and what messages will carry the day and whether you can charge more or not based on some of the guidance we just discussed. So, okay, uh, that's about green products and sustainability definition. Now, how do you really make this thing roll within the organization? How do you build it into the lifeblood? And, you know, having worked on this for several decades and trial and error and had some good successes and some, you know, fantastic failures, which you learn from, uh, you know, I come away with some guidance that I wish I had when I started off doing this, and I'll share it with you. And, in fact, that's what's in the book. Uh, a lot more on the details of uh, this process there. And I kind of break it down into these categories. First of those drivers. You know, the, it, an organization, a company is sort of, uh, it has, you have to overcome momentum. The, the momentum is to sit still in one place. So how do you move the organization? How do you get change to happen? Often uh, a challenging thing to do. So there are those things that help drive the organization forward. Uh, then are the things that I call efficient uh, enablers. Uh, those are the things that you need to do in your organization to make it more receptive to sustainability, uh, to help it uh, manage and drive sustainability, and so you can make certain adjustments to the organization itself and to enable it to be more successful as it moves forward. But, of course, you need to define the pathway. And the pathway, uh, one of the reasons, you know, we talked about the conference board policy, Here's a sort of an understanding of what we're trying to do. This you can communicate to employees and suppliers and others. You say, this is what we're trying to achieve. This is what we stand for. This is what sustainability is about. Now let's talk about what your role is and how we make all of that happen. So you really need to define the pathway because otherwise people are going in, you know, 50 different directions. You need to really get them aligned, moving in one direction to try to achieve the objectives that uh, we're setting around sustainability. And, of course, the... Uh, Evaluators, once you're on that path, you need to make sure you stay on that path. So there are certain tools and things to use to make sure you're on the way uh, and staying uh, in that, uh, on the path to, uh, to a more sustainable organization. And, of course, at the end with these curlicues, uh, you have to make sure that it's just not stagnant. It's a, there's a continual improvement process. So let's kind of take uh, a few minutes to look at some of these. Uh, drivers, the very things you might think champion leader, somebody that manages the thing and drive it forward. But the second part is critical, visible top management support. Not just the CEO that says, oh, yeah, I support that stuff, but somebody that walks the talk, gets out, does things, uh, supports things, makes speeches, uh, rewards people, and so forth, that shows that that person is involved and is very visible in uh, living and, and pursuing uh, sustainability. You need an approach to sell it. Uh, book talks about how you can go about uh, making this argument for, uh, remember, a process that looks through the threats and opportunities and so forth. Uh, and you need uh, sort of the carrots and sticks to reward the behavior that you're looking for, those that are moving towards sustainability, and making sure people are held accountable if they try to uh, go otherwise. Efficient enablers, right organizational structure. Uh, a lot of that has to do with, these days, with the multifunctional uh, teams, because as you looked at the different issues, you got human rights or uh, HR, human resources issues, you got environmental issues, you got finance issues. So you really need a, a, a mix of people coming together to help uh, drive sustainability across your organization. Deployment and integration are important. Okay, we've got to come up with these initiatives, and we've got to roll them out to the suppliers, we've got to roll them out to our employees, uh, and we've got to make it effective. So. Coming up with great ideas, sitting back at corporate headquarters is not enough. How do you deploy it, and how do you get people to really buy in and own the thing themselves? And as I say, suppliers are part of that. Why supply? Why, why focus on supply chain? There's a lot of focus on that these days. Well, public perceives that certainly big companies are responsible for supply chain. If you uh, if you're you know having some shoes made in a sweatshop. You can't just say, oh, you know, that's not part of my company. I contracted that out. That's not going to fly these days. So that's Kathy Lee different. You know, that's not going to work. Uh, the other thing is, you know, this is really what the NGOs, the activist groups are focusing on. They're focusing on supply chain, and the consumers are sensitive to uh, the ethical behavior of producers. So, you know, if you can say, that, hey, you know, you're working with these, these uh, sweatshops, uh, you know, consumers are not going to like that. And the question is, okay, so 
oh, what's the big deal with the NGOs? Why are they focused on it? Uh, well, it's kind of like Willie Sutton. You know, asking why he robs banks all the time. Well, he says that's where the money is. So why do the NGOs focus on supply chain? Well, that's where the impacts are. Big social impacts, big environmental impacts along the supply chain. Uh, and it has some significant consequences. And you'll see that in terms of uh, work being done regarding product labeling, where uh, companies are trying to decide how are we going to label our products, how are we going to show people what our impacts are and how we're reducing those impacts, how can we show that effectively in a way that this doesn't, doesn't misrepresent um, what we're doing on sustainability. The other thing that's driving is legal compliance, a whole alphabet soup of things, particularly in Europe where you've got hazardous substances, electronics uh, issues with uh, packaging take back, a uh, whole host of issues in legislation, particularly in Europe, driving a lot of that. Some of that's coming over to the U.S. Supply chain efficiency, there's a, like the green supplier network, the EPA sponsors, where they match up uh, suppliers with their customers and they work together and they find that they can really pull out a lot of waste from the supply chain and reduce costs significantly. And the reality is a lot of companies are saying, hey, sustainability, we're buying into that, we're going to hold it out as a strategic initiative. And we, as part of that strategic initiative, we're going to, of course, look at our supply chain because that's what our stakeholders want. So these are all the reasons that supply chains are getting a lot more focused. And you look at Walmart, even they're doing it, they've got a questionnaire again, energy, climate, water waste, you know, safety, labor, uh, human rights, community development. But the other interesting thing that's becoming focus is this, sub-supplier oversight. Think of Mattel. Mattel had all of these little toys, little, uh, little CI Joes, I don't know what they were, that were made in China. Uh, great, you know, the kids loved it. But unfortunately, the sub-sub-supplier that was making the paint that they were using to paint these toys uh, you know, provided lead paint. Okay, you can't sell, you know, toys with lead paint to kids. So what happened? Well, you had a $100 million recall. Yeah, you don't want to do that, right? You'd rather avoid a $100 million recall if you're Mattel. Well, so that's why this sub-supplier -supply, oversight is critical, and that's why companies are pushing, like Walmart, are pushing that. They want their suppliers to look deeper into their own supply chains to make sure things are, are proper environmentally and socially. And quite frankly, uh, all these companies doing this, you can say, oh, wait a minute, you know, I've got 150 different companies all asking me for information. It's like overwhelming the suppliers. And so that became apparent. So now what, what companies are doing is they're banding together in these consortiums. Here's one uh, with, you know, Walmart's involved in the sustainability consortium. And they're not only looking at trying to get information from suppliers where they post it on the web and then all the companies can feed off of that, but also looking at this data to see what it tells them in terms of how they might shape some labeling around social and environmental impacts. And you can see other groups too. There's some around apparel, electronic industry, and the like. So companies are bunching together. They're teaming up uh, to try to get at this, and there's a lot more to be done on the supplier side. So here we have the pathway, a vision and policy similar to the one we talked about with the conference board an operating system, which is basically a process similar to the one we've just been talking about. And of course, you've got to prioritize. Again, you remember we talked about the value, making the business case, it's a value, it's a process of, of prioritizing. And uh, how do you do that? How do you align the company's strategic initiatives with sustainability? Lots of different ways. Here's one that we used, uh, similar to one that used at Baxter, where you actually create objectives geared to stakeholder groups, employee objectives, those involving in finance, investors, those involving customers and suppliers, those involving a community and the government. And what you do is once you lay those out, you find that they do touch on what you lay them out in this way. They do touch on economic, social, and financial issues. Uh, so you get a good mix of sustainability objectives with that kind of a framework. Evaluators, how do you stay on track? Well, you've got to measure indicators and goals. Uh, doing reporting, again, thousands of companies doing these sustainability reports. Uh, and then it's not just doing the reports, but then you have to, you know, have the courage to go out to your stakeholders, your suppliers, your employees, your communities and the like, and say, how are we doing? Here's a report of our performance. What do you think? How's the reporting going? Are we being truthful? Are we being uh, as open as you'd like us to be? 
Uh, are we? Uh, how's our progress? Do you think it's good or not so good? Where do we need to improve? Where are we doing well? Uh, you really need to have that engagement if you want to see yourself as others see you. Uh, otherwise, you're you know operating in a vacuum and you're not going to be uh, making the improvements that are uh, so important to your stakeholders. But it's not just uh, you know these indicators. And here are some. This is a little study of about uh, almost a dozen companies that were active in sustainability. You can see where their goals were. Uh, on the brown, you've got metric number goals, and then the blue is other types of goals. Greenhouse gases, energy, uh, water, and so forth. But social goals, too, safety, um, philanthropy, diversity, scattered in there. So these are the, actually the goals that those, companies, those particular companies were looking at uh, at the time I talked to them. Again, uh, this is the whole process, drivers, efficient enablers, pathway evaluators. But it's one thing to do that, but it's not the end of the day because you really need this continuous, continual improvement process where you put together a plan, you uh, collect, you, see, you go out and perform, uh, then you see how well you did, you measure your performance, uh, you identify your strengths and gaps, and uh, then you uh, report and get feedback from the stakeholders, and then you plan again for better improvement. And so it's an ongoing process, often done annually, continuing to improve to make sure that you don't become stagnant, because certainly sustainability trends are not stagnant. They're ongoing, and to stay on top of them, you really need an ongoing process that enables you to make these adjustments. For more information on it, the Ginsu Knives and the Chopper Cutter Dicer, along with the book. <laughs> and so with that, I think we're close to question time. Absolutely. And I know Manetta, she's been watching some of the uh, chat box. So perhaps some questions have come in from Manetta. OK, don't overwhelm me with questions. I can't keep up. <laughs> um, so, hello. We usually give everyone a few minutes in the chat box because uh, it takes them a minute. So folks uh, viewing electronically or remotely, please enter any questions in the chat box or um, uh, via Twitter at uh, SLPS Thursday, hashtag SLPS Thursday, and we will get them to um, the speaker. Um, Bill, I know you've been working on this a while. <clears throat> How much, uh, just on a kind of a quick graph or continuum, where, where do you feel that this, this is in corporate America right now? I mean, is this halfway up or, you know, it, Certainly, is something that's being talked about and looked at. Um, yeah, and more so now, I would say, than in the past. You got a feel for where we're at on that virtuous cycle. Yeah, the question is, uh, how far along is business yeah. or general society in the U.S. Uh, on the sustainability continuum in terms of where we should be, where organizations should be? Um, it's an interesting question because I've been first involved with environmental issues for almost 40 years. So I've seen, you know, quite a bit of transformation. And uh, sometimes where the issues are hot and sometimes where they're not so hot, obviously they become hot where there's some big disaster. Uh, BP in the Gulf, you know, tends to rile up companies and rile up uh, stakeholders and gets companies, get, makes companies become more active in these areas. And so over the years, uh, both environmental responsibility and in the broader sense, sustainability, is you could sort of chart it like a stock exchange returns. You have your times where there's downs, but overall the market over the long term has gone up. And overall the focus on these issues has gone up. And, and the thing that I, I think is very encouraging in the surveys that we talked about here today is that uh, there's a realization that, okay, we can't, this is not just a silo program we put over in the corner of the company. If we're going to do this, it has to be integrated. And stakeholders are recognizing that too. They're saying, look, it's not enough for you to do these fancy things over here. You've got to really make it part of the life of your organization. Show me how you're doing that. And that's the name of the game now. That wasn't the name of the game three or four or five years ago. So uh, just from that perspective, I think we're evolving. There's obviously uh, leaders. Uh, companies that are getting out front and doing some, you know, fantastic things that are progressive and uh, on the cutting edge of some of this. Uh, but the reality is, uh, you know, every company is sort of operating in the gray area. 
you know, Exxon Mobil. Oh man, they're terrible because, you know, Exxon Valdez and, you know, they didn't da 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 da. But, okay, wait a minute, you look closer and you see they have one of the top safety programs in the world. So, you know, for those of us in business, we'll get to look inside these organizations. We say, oh yeah, this may be something people are critical of, but this thing over here that they're not even paying attention to might be, you know, the top quality. So there's a good deal of that going on. But overall, you know, there's lots of things yet to be done. Uh, I don't know that anybody's doing it perfectly yet. Good progress is being made, and I'm very encouraged by the focus on integration. I was curious if there was an exact um, moment or key event that caused companies to become more interested in producing green and increasing results. Like, was it a certain UN movement or an actual Political thing or something that's kind of just happening that randomly. Uh, well, uh, you say I mean it's hard to generalize about companies in general, but uh, you know the, the the thing that really makes a difference is uh, when you get some competitors out there uh, that are getting good publicity. Their brand strength is up. Stakeholders like it. Their products are selling well. Uh, reports show that they save billions of dollars through waste reduction. Uh, you know, um, people love them because of the social initiatives they're undertaking, uh, and they don't seem to have the bad press that maybe you have and, and the problems that you have where you're firefighting all the time. So, you know, looking down the road and seeing your competitor who seems to have their act together and making great value out of this is probably the biggest driver of anything. And the reality is inside a company, uh, one of the biggest drivers is the ego of the CEO. I mean, those guys, you know, they don't get to those high positions without having strong egos. And they, how do they get strong egos? Well, we want to be the best. We want to beat out our competitor. I want to beat out my rivals. Uh, I can't be looking like a schmuck here when everybody else is moving forward. And so sometimes it's a simple matter of a CEO ego saying, hey, look, you know, we need to get with it. Everybody else in the block is doing this. We're kind of behind. Let's step it up. Or it may be they get in trouble. Some of the most... Uh, no lawsuits. A big, well, even worse than lawsuits is a, a big adverse publicity. Uh, you know, you get some big issue that creates headlines day after day after day. And in fact, back in the old days, there was a program uh, that the EPA put out when they first required the reporting of hazardous substances. They started saying, okay, this company is emitting this, this company is emitting that. And the company said, well, wait a minute, I've got all the legal permits I need. And public wasn't buying it. They said, look, we don't care if you've got the permit. We don't want that having the substance, you know, floating over our house. We don't want our children inhaling that. And so more than the law, it was this, this uh, public pressure that drove these companies to become very aggressive in reducing their toxic air emissions. And certainly my company, my old company, Baxter, you know, knocked out 90 plus percent of its toxic emissions because of that kind of pressure to be candid about it. So, uh, you know, it's the transparency. I always like to say uh, light brings heat brings change. It's like the laws of chemistry, but it's the laws of, you know, corporate dynamics. You shine the light on something, you let people know, you become transparent about it, you know, it creates a good deal of heat, a good deal of angst within a company, and often that brings about, you know, positive change because they don't want to be under the angst spotlight. So it's a whole host of things, but um, I think the fact that some companies are doing it and finding good value, that more than anything else is bringing other companies around to say, this is real and we've got to do it. It's not just tree hugging. It's a business issue, a business initiative, a business imperative to come back to the title of the presentation today. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the cost. You said earlier sustainability costs. Can you kind of speak a little bit to that in terms of my budgets as opposed to what you invest, what you get in return? Well, uh, I mean, uh, when you talk about cost, yeah, the question is about cost, sustainability costs, how much do you invest and how do you do the return, so forth and so on. Uh, that's a, a very important issue because um, even back in my old environmental days in Baxter, one of the things that became very apparent was 
okay, you're going to push the company to move forward because, A, you know, ethically it's the right thing to do, B, stakeholders, the customers expected of you, and C, it makes good business sense. And to make that third argument, we went out to collect data. Tell me where you work, you know, environmentally, you know, in environmentally attractive ways to save and how much money you save. And, you know, where have you done certain things where it actually costs money? And so out of that, we actually created, with the help of our finance uh, guys, we created an environmental financial statement. And we published it even here. The company's still doing it even now, 15 years later. Every year they publish a statement that says, okay, here's how much we're spending on our environmental initiatives, and here's some of the savings and cost avoidance we, we're seeing, you know, as a consequence. And here are some costs that we have that, you know, are not offset. But the general takeaway was, you know, we're not trying to be, you know, uh, SEC uh, financial type precision in this. We're not trying to bring that kind of precision. But what we want is the hallway argument where, you, where people say, yeah, I do have the, the, a good gut reaction that this is making good financial sense to us to pursue these initiatives in a proactive way. Because remember that chart on, uh, on threats and opportunities? That's really what sustainability is about, threats and opportunities. And then, of course, it's the question, what's that going to cost us? That's always in the equation. Lost opportunity. That's, yeah, and it's just like, here's what we can get from it. Here's how much it's going to cost. We have to prioritize. You know, the quick hitters where we're going to gain great value with little cost. Boom, you do those now. Those that made, oh, questionable benefit, significant cost. Okay, those are maybe a little later. But if it's a big risk, you can't afford to wait. You may have to say, all right, we're going to pony up the money anyway because we can't. We could not stand the heat of having this turn against us. You can't stand these disasters, you know, emergency response, crisis response kind of stuff. You've got to be ready for that. So, you know, economics is always part of the picture. Uh, it's part of the equation. It's part of the process of doing the SWOT analysis. Um, but if you're smart about it and you really understand the trends and you really understand what those opportunities and threats are, it's a heck of a lot easier to make the argument and justify the cost for, for many of those things. There are going to be some where uh, costs and, and the, the minor risk and opportunity suggest no action should be taken. That's a reality. Okay, anything else? Bill, is there any way as a consumer that I can select the company that is sustainability, for practicing sustainability. How do I know as an average consumer which company A or company B is better at it? Uh, the question is, how do I know if I'm trying, if I'm a consumer trying to pick products, how do I know if company A or company B is better at sustainability? Uh, and, and the reality is it's not easy to know because, as I say, there's a lot of gray in there. They may be, you know, getting adverse headlines on one topic, but be dynamite in terms of working on other issues that may not get so much visibility. There are, you know, all these rating things. Uh, there's lots of different rating associations out there that rate companies. You see them published in Newsweek and, you know, a host of different publications. Uh, but the problem is that each of those has in its own criteria. Nobody has, you know, this is the set criteria. Everybody's going to be judged against that. And so there is an initiative underway to deal with this problem uh, where they're coming together and they're saying, okay, we know we've got all these rating organizations out there and they're all different. Let's see if we can come up with some standards that are consistent that help us sort through this mess so we get ratings that are, are, uh, are valuable. And the, the, uh, the sustainability consortium that I talked about where well, Walmart and J&J &J and those companies are working together, they've also looked at this and they said, look, we want a way of communicating with our consumers out there in the aisle, in the, in the labeling. We want to be able to say, here's the advantages of this product over that one from a social environmental perspective. But that isn't easy to do. Um, Timber, that's the Timberland, yeah, the shoe company has ventured down that path with some of their labeling. And they've got some very interesting labels that talk about, uh, for example, environmental impact. But um, that's, it's still work in progress. So the best you can do is catch an article on uh, various publications on uh, companies and their ratings, uh, best place to work kind of list as well, uh, diversity list as well. So there's a whole host of social and environmental issues. But the, 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 the area, the landscape is so broad, and there's so, it's so much inconsistency that it's really tough to, um, 
to be able to nail that down precisely. A lot of times people are just say, I'm not going to buy BP gas because of what happened in the Gulf. It's, it, it gets to be simple one issue thing, and sometimes that's not fair, but that's the reality of how people go about it. And we're trying to, there's a lot of initiatives underway to try to bring some more sophistication to that, labeling issues as well as changing the rating organizations. Sorry, I can't be more specific about it. <laughs> I know Manetta has said she had a few questions coming through the chat box. Let's okay. see what she has to say. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, um, one of them is, I'll read it to you directly, do you think sustainability efforts within companies are most effective when they are approached from the top down from management or from the bottom up with an employee group? Okay, top down versus top, bottom up. Uh, well, as you saw from my SOS thing there, you know, one of the drivers is your CEO. It's hard, you know, since the CEO helps uh, set the priorities of the organization, what are we going to spend money on? What are we going to focus on? What are we going to devote our time to? Since the CEO has a lot to do with that, you really do need to try to bring him in and make sure he walks the talk, not just the casual, oh, yeah, that's fine, go ahead and do that. It's, you know, step up to the plate, uh, give some speeches around this, tell, tell people what the company's doing about it, Incorporate it in your uh, investor meetings that you have. Uh, reward people individually. Uh, acknowledge them if they're doing great in these areas of sustainability. Uh, you know, you, need, you do need to have the top uh, CEO behind it. But your ultimate objective, you know, this whole issue of integration, uh, it's all about driving it into the lifeblood of the organization where I may be a, a line worker on an assembly line, and if I need to understand what the sustainability values of the company are, I need to buy into that. I need to believe it myself. And then when I'm making individual decisions, I need to have that in the back of my mind. Is this consistent with, with our company values? And if you see something that's not, raise the hand and say, look, that's not consistent with what you know our spouse values are here. We can't be doing that. Uh, but Herb Keller uh, from Southwest, CEO from Southwest, very successful guy, said, He's a big believer in having those values stated outright because it saves a lot of time. You don't have to mess around with issues that are going to cause trouble. You know, it can quickly be dispensed with by saying, you know, that's not consistent with our values. Forget that. Let's move on. And he, he always believed in having a set of values laid out uh, for his, his employees and so forth. So the answer is yes. It needs to be top, and ultimately the objective is to drive it down so everybody on the grassroots level uh, is excited about it and uh, is moving forward. One of the things we used to do at Baxter, uh, which I thought was very helpful, is I had a, I always had in my office a big box of glass, little glass, pa glass paperweights that were uh, sustainability excellence awards. And so I would go out to visit a plant and I would uh, call the manufacturing site and I'd say, look, I'm coming out and I want you to give me a list of two or three names of employees line workers and so forth that you think are, you know, exemplary and, you know, and pursuing sustainability in their own little way and, and tell me what they've done. And so I would then show up with these special uh, awards and then I would, we would have a break where all the employees would come to the lunchroom and I'd get up and talk about the company and what we're doing on sustainability and then I would single out these individuals and bring them up and, and provide them uh, this recognition because I understood that if you're going to make these things move forward, you've got to have the buy-in of those kinds of folks. You've got to tell them, look, it matters to us. We recognize what you're doing. We want the rest of you to do what they're doing, and it's making a difference. And here, here are the people right here that you can see that uh, are making that difference. And it's in it's in it's some ways that you can do too. It's not just for your plant manager and for the exalted uh, executives back at corporate to make all of these decisions and make things happen. You can make things happen too. Here's some examples. So it's really important as you're managing those programs to get that message down and to encourage action from the very bottom. Without that, you know, it's hard to make change happen and it's hard to bring that ethic, that sustainability ethic to the organization. Okay, um, while I have a moment, I'm just going to remind folks to put things in the chat box or on Twitter if they have questions. Use hashtag SLPS Thursday, all one word, um, or in the chat box. And if we ha um, don't get to your question in the next minute or two, please resubmit it because maybe we didn't see it. 
Um, okay, so another question that has come in is, um, uh, what are credible equal label equal li eco labels for products um, or businesses? You mentioned Energy Star for computer devices. What other others are credible and exist? Uh, there is a there is a whole list of uh, each, each basically each country has its own um, eco labels. Um, some more rigorous than others, um, but. Um, you know, there's uh, you know Green Angel, a bunch of bunch of them, and the, the the a quick sort of survey in Google will give you a list, and there's associations that oversee uh, those labels too to try to bring some consistency to it. Um, so I you know I can't say that there's one in particular that stands out as being better than others, but there are some. Uh, if you uh, if you would do a little search, you will find some that that seem to be uh, more commonly uh, discussed. Sorry, I can't be more specific on that one. But there are, you know, there are there are individual there are individual uh, there are individual uh, recognitions too. Like a, you know, Energy Star for for equipment, uh, LEED of course for buildings. Uh, you know, you have you pick your product and use probably a, a group or some sort of labeling uh, that that attaches to it. So there's a there's a wide range of them, and there's. For example, there's also on the ag side, there's all these uh, sustainability agriculture standards. And the question is, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, organic. It's something different. Uh, so, you know, you can say, okay, does this organization meet those standards? Uh, do they report in GRI? There's another place to go to see uh, how well they report. And, and there's, uh, you know, more, you know, that's really where you can dive in and see what the company is really doing on their products and what they're really doing on on their uh, production uh, facilities as well. Because it's one thing to have a, a, an attractive product from a socially environmental perspective, but if it's made with processes that aren't too socially or environmentally responsible, then it's something to avoid. Okay, another one that's come in is, does sustainability in companies impact the amount of money they make? Are they making less money taking on, on the sustainability role? Uh, that's a really good question because there are a number of studies that go to the stock exchange that say, look, you know, if you do well on sustainability, then your uh, returns on your investments go up and the stock price goes up and da-da-da-da. The problem with those studies is, is that uh, when you say, oh, this is, a, this is a company moving towards sustainability, there's a thousand different ways to evaluate a company. You know, one company says, oh, you know, based on my criteria, Walmart's right up there on the top. And another guy will say, oh, wait a minute, based on my criteria, Walmart's right down on the bottom. Well, this first guy says, well, yeah, but look at the supply chain, all the stuff they're doing to reduce energy and make their supply chain more efficient and all the progressive things there and the other people go, yeah, but look at the wages and the employee issues and da da da. So uh, the problem then becomes, as these studies show, is that often companies can be on the good list or the bad list, depends on how you evaluate them. And so in the end, when you kind of put it all together, it's pretty much a wash. The bottom line is, uh, I think the conclusion is, is that you can be progressively uh, sustainable or moving towards sustainability and not pay a penalty uh, in terms of uh, economic results. And the reality is, um, and I think this is maybe a little more important, this is, this is my insight, the companies that are progressive on sustainability, that take it seriously, that become strategic about it, that report on it, and have their metrics together and their goals together, you know, those are companies that have their act together. And so they have their act together around these issues. They often have their act together around other issues as well. Uh, on how they, you know, develop products and manage the markets and so forth. So it's a sign, I think, uh, a progressive and, and solid sustainability initiative, initiative is a sign of good management. And good management tends to produce good, better long-term results. Uh, it's not a guarantee uh, that your company is going to be successful long-term, but it certainly, I think, helps, helps in that regard. Okay, another is, uh, what is the most challenging sustainability integration and advising you have done in your career? The most challenging sustainability integration issue or approach or? Well, uh, you know, I'll give you a couple. Let me, let, me give, let, let me give you one that kind of stands out in my 
mind. I forgot about this, but now it comes to mind. Uh, and I'm sure people who are dealing with companies uh, may run into this. And that's dealing with research and development people. You know, most of these guys have like PhDs or more. And nobody ever told them they were stupid. And nobody, <laughs> and certainly they don't think that themselves. And so, you know, they think they, you know, if there's something to be understood and known, they know that. They understand that. Don't tell me how to do it. So uh, there's a little different way you approach sort of R&D people and, and try to, you know, very critical that you get them involved and, and let them tap their innovation and ingenuity to help move sustainability forward because there's a wealth of, of uh, knowledge and skill and so forth that they bring to the table. But it's a, a little challenging because of the strong sort of ego of the, of the typical PhD R&D guy. So it's a little bit more delicate than maybe some of your uh, run-of-the-mill factory uh, folk that you're, uh, or factory operations that you're dealing with. You know, these guys are dealing with in rarefied air, and so you have to be more sensitive to that ethic and more sensitive to their own view of themselves and where they, how they receive and deal with authority. The other thing is, uh, and I talk about this in the book, is when you work on global programs, uh, you have to be very sensitive to individual, like country cultures. So you go to, uh, you go to Latin America or to some places in Asia, they're very respectful of authority and, oh, you say something, okay, it's the law, and we're going to go make that happen even if it's stupid, but because you said so. So, you know, whatever you say, we're going to do, and uh, you got to be mindful of that. You don't, because, you know, you want to get feedback from them. Sometimes they're hesitant to say, well, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard, and which is really what you need to hear, but they won't tell you that. On the other hand, you go to Australia, and, you know, uh, you're all jerks. You don't know what you're doing. You know, we can make this out. And actually, they're pretty progressive. They were, at least I found that they've been very progressive in, in moving forward and doing things constructively and making a lot of things happen, but they will often bark a lot. Uh, they will often bark a lot, and so that's part of their culture, and so you have to just say, okay, I know these guys. These guys are going to bark, but at the end of the day, they're going to step up, and they're going to do well, and they're going to excel, and so that's part of the culture you're dealing with. So as you're rolling out global programs, uh, first and foremost, before you start doing these deployments, if you will, you need to have a good sense of the culture, and you need to find creative ways of getting them involved and getting the feedback from them to make sure that what you're, you're trying to do uh, is going to work for them. Because what you do here in the U.S. may, not, may need some adjustment or tweaks or, uh, to, to work there, and my vice versa. There may be things that they're doing where we say, hey, wait a minute, you know, these guys are ahead of us. We really need to listen to what they're doing and, and saying and uh, try, to, try to take on some of that ourselves here. So those are some of the challenging things. I think dealing with country cultures, uh, dealing with uh, cultures of individual groups within companies can be the most challenging thing. And, and finding the right approach uh, that, that strikes a, 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 a very constructive note with those folks is, is critical. Uh, another one that's come in, if you're a small business, where do you even start? Uh, you start by reading the chapter of my book on small business. <laughs> <laughs> Again, with the Ginsu knives and the chopper, slicer, dicer, uh, you can make great headway. But, you know, the reality is uh, a lot of the same things um, apply, uh, except that uh, what you find with small companies is it boils down to more local stuff. So, okay, I'm not going to go out and engage these global stakeholders. I'm going to, you know, work with my people, the people in my community. I'm going to... Uh, work on a charitable pancake breakfast and da 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 and try to get to know the people in my community and, and let them see that I'm a, a, a somebody that's going to contribute to the welfare of this community. I'm going to help the scouting groups and so forth. And that tends to pay, you know, not only does it kind of capture our, our reputation being environmentally and socially responsible, but uh, it also, you know, helps drive business is the reality. And that's why these small guys often step up and start doing some of that. But it's, uh, you have to just gear it down uh, to, to their level. And, you know, you talk about, oh, going out and doing a sustainability report. Okay, I'm going to type some up and maybe something up and maybe post it on my website. It's very simple. doesn't have to be elaborate. 
I'm going to talk about what I'm doing on a few things. Uh, so you just gear it down uh, to the issues that are important to those companies, and you find ways to approach it that are very simple. You obviously, you don't have the, the big administrative support that you would find in a larger company. You can't do a lot of the things that may be done there. But there's a lot of resources out that can help you uh, find a direction and, uh, and certainly make it germane, make it relevant, make it important to you, and help you, uh, as I say, from a local perspective, which is more often where these uh, small uh, organizations focus. OK, the last one I believe we have, and if, if I'm wrong, please um, put it back in the chat box to make sure I see it, uh, or back in Twitter. The last one I believe that hasn't been read um, in the remote world is, what country is the leader in sustainability integration in business? Well, um, that's a very interesting question, um, because uh, and uh, actually, I was at a meeting where we were kind of debating some of this the other day. Uh, because it, it really depends on what parts of sustainability you're talking about. If you're saying, OK, um, who's the most progressive on products, green products and the like? Uh, certainly, the Northern Europeans are. I think you know the Germans and some of those, the Brits, a little bit. But uh, certainly, the, the Northern Europeans are pretty progressive on green products. Um, they have, uh, the U.S. was way out in the lead in terms of moving forward on uh, like diversity and uh, environmental responsibility, environmental legislation. Uh, Europeans caught up. But one of the things they still lag at is accountability. OK, so I'm in Europe. I have a factory. I'm not meeting all the standards. Uh, OK, what's going to happen to me? Well, I'm not going to get a big fine. The government may knock on our door and say, and say come, let us reason together. But they're not going to you know, take me to court and hold me accountable for paying uh, $35 million. That's just not going to happen there. Uh, so you know, the U.S. is still the big, uh, the big bad man in the, in the room and, you know, is going to jerk your chain if you, if you step too far out of line. So an accountability, you know, making sure that there's responsibility for following the rules. Uh, the U.S. is still in the lead, but they've fallen way behind with regard to products. Um, trying to catch up there, I think, in some places. Uh, and there's a lot of other areas where they, uh, where they do lag. And I would say, for the most part, uh, Western Europe tends to be more progressive in, in many of these arenas. Um, but you have to look at individual companies. So the problem is, or the challenge is, is that you know, multinational company is that just that. It's multinational. And so, OK, I've got a headquarters here in the US, but you know, I've got operations here, there, and every place else. And so uh, to run a multinational company, you really need to look at, you know, the culture and the ethics and the values in those different parts of the world. And that all plays it together in coming and forming the approach that multinationals take. So multinationals often have um, sort of best practices. There's, there's, I mean, sometimes they are worst practices in the case of, like, BP and some others, but uh, sometimes their best practices, they, the best practices you can find are there. And certainly that's true when you see uh, multinationals going into China and, and places like that. They carry with them their, their high standards, and they say, look, um, here's our environmental standards, here's our social standards, here's blah, blah, blah. And the reality is what they don't want to have to answer is they don't want to have to answer a question where somebody says, so do you value life more in the U.S. than you do in China? Or do you value life more in the U.S. than you do in Bangladesh? No big company wants to say, no, we have reduced standards there. They have to be able to say, no, we have a minimum level of standards that apply across the board. We value the environment. We value our employees. We value our customers, at least in this level, uh, wherever we do business. So that's an important, critical thing for companies to be able to say. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and thank Bill for his really great presentation. So sure, thank you. Sure. Very interesting, thought-provoking. Um, looking forward to December already. Um, that will be streamed live from MCC on Thursday, December 3rd. And that will be Dr. Mark DeCry from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and Carrie Hackingcamp, the Executive Director of WasteCat Nebraska. And they will be discussing the results of Nebraska's recycling study and future implications of recycling. So please join us again next month on Thursday, December 3rd at 3.30. And again, thank you very much, Bill. So. What? <laughs>